Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this biking genetics webinar on grazing genetics, the red revolution. Um, during this webinar, um, we're going to learn about how can biking red help boost health and efficiency in your herd. Uh, scientifically proven results with three-way crossbreeding with Viking Red and benefits of a structured crossbreeding system. Uh, just to go through a few housekeeping areas uh, during the webinar, uh, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be sent to all participants by email. Um, all, all webinar participants are muted, so there's no conversation between anybody during the webinar. Um, however, do feel free to make any comments using the chat button. Uh, down in the bottom right hand corner and if you have any questions again do please feel free to add any questions into the questions button again down in the, the bottom right hand corner and we will join the webinar and after the uh, main presentation uh, we'll make sure we try and answer most of those questions during the time allotted um, and if we don't have time to uh, to answer them all we will make sure we send replies to the uh, respective participants um, during the webinar, halfway through, there will also be a poll. Um, I'll come back with more details on that at the time, but uh, you'll, you'll notice there is a poll button again down in the bottom right hand corner to use for that when we uh, when that time comes. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, you to our main speaker this evening, uh, Jakob, who is the Senior Breeding Manager at Viking Genetics. Uh, he's had 15 years in the cattle breeding industry. Um, he has an animal science degree from the University of Copenhagen, uh, specializing in animal genetics. And Jakob's role within Viking Genetics is leading the Viking Red breeding program with a, with a, fo with a greener focus. Um, so what I'd like to do at this stage is hand across to Jakob to take the floor. Um, and uh, I'll be back with you uh, once, uh, once we get to that time. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And first of all, I will say thank you very much for the possibility to tell about uh, the red breed, Viking Red, and also the amazing uh, things that the red breed can do and the crossbreeding Golden Cross can do in the grazing and why it's very, very suitable for the spring block uh, carving. Uh, I will get a presentation. Shared. So, my name is Jakob Lykke Vorgård. I'm at Matset, Senior Breeding Manager at uh, Viking Genetic, responsible for the Red Breeding Program. And a little bit about my background. I grew up on a, on a dairy farm, uh, and my plan was to be a, a farmer and milking cows. Uh, so I took uh, education as farmer, I worked on different farms uh, in different uh, countries. Then I took to university. Uh, thought it would be good to have some education uh, beside farming if I couldn't farm. And there I found out that it was a lot more fun to work with the genetic uh, and work with the breeding uh, instead of uh, milking cows. And then I could also sleep a little bit longer in the morning. So I uh, kept on working with the genetic. Uh, I uh, became after university advisor in, uh, in the Danish company Viking Denmark where I was breeding advisor for herds both with red, Holstein, Jersey, and crossbreeding. So I'm very familiar with, with all the breeds and all the benefits and different production system, uh, which is a huge advantage in, in my uh, job today. In the last 10 years, I've been working with Viking Genetic, uh, and in the last two years, I've been uh, responsible for the red uh, breeding program. Uh, tonight, uh, the topic I have in focus is uh, how Viking Red can help boost uh, health and efficiency in your grazing herd. Uh, we would look on uh, some scientifically proven result uh, with tree red crossbreeding where Viking Red is included. Uh, I will tell you about the benefits of the structure crossbreeding system. Uh, when we structure a crossbreeding system, we get uh, most out of it. And then in the end, I will make some uh, take a trip uh, to the barn, I can say, uh, to show a little bit uh, some science and uh, how uh, we hopefully in the future can support you uh, from Viking Genetics together with the UK team. First, I would uh, lift a little bit up, uh, I would say, in, in, in the helicopter, uh, because when we are talking uh, crossbreeding, uh, grazing uh, and Viking Red, uh, and we are looking into 
uh, some of the statement uh, and question uh, that is put up. Uh, we are we often have uh, questions remark according to uh, ways to increase efficiency, way to get more healthy, long lasting cows, and how can we get a trouble free cows uh, that do not attend, uh, require a lot of attendment, how can we reduce cost? And uh, crossbreeding and the secret ingredient, as I call the Viking red, is a way that uh, can help with uh, with uh, with these uh, with these things. So that's what I will also show you a little bit today. How can some of these statement, matter of fact, uh, go out and work in, in in your herd? Then I would make uh, from the helicopter a very fast landing. I would go straight down to the machine room to say what we have in the Nordic country and what we think is quite unique is that we are having a registration system in the Nordic country that is uh, very, very big. And that is our machine room. That is our basic to make good genetic uh, progress in many, many different traits. We are having one big database where everything is uh, collected uh, they have the database in Denmark, Sweden, and Finland in the three countries, and they are merged the data there, put into the breeding evaluation. And there we get the uh, data in from the veterinarians. We have data in from hoof trimmers as AI technicians and also do-it-yourself farmers is putting in uh, information about fertility. We have classifiers uh, going around in the different herds. And then the most important person in this registration system, that is matter of fact, the farmer himself and the employed on the farms. We also get data from the AMS system and that is both uh, milk production, but we also got data as how is the order look like, how is the tits placement and so on, and the milking speed. So we're getting more and more data from the AMS system. Uh, and we also get some quite value data according to feed efficiency and, and body weight and so on. I'll come back to that later. And then of course, milk recording uh, and the slaughterhouse is giving in very, very many data, uh, a huge amount of uh, registration is coming in. And when I said it's, it's a little bit uh, unique, what we're saying, uh, that's because we are getting so much uh, data in. Uh, it, it's very much data we are collecting that 95% of the herd is, is milk recording. We get a lot of data in milk recording. We get a lot of data in it to health, uh, a lot of data in the classification, fertility, and hoof trimming. So a lot of the herds is giving data into this database. And then you can ask yourself, why are they doing that? Uh, I can tell you it's, it's not just to make good breeding values. The farmer is doing it mostly for themselves because all this data, they can turn around and use them as management tools in the herd. So the farmer can see the big benefit of all this registration for himself, and then the big size value. And you also know that it's giving very good breeding values and reliable breeding values that he can use to select the next generation in his herd. In the Nordic country, we have been breeding for health and production efficiency for many, many years. And we, matter of fact, can go back to 1980 when we started with production. And already there, we had calving uh, indexes. We have daughter fertility. And then we had the most classic as uh, classification and, uh, and makeability. Then already in 1982, that's 40 years ago, we had the other health index, and that is based on clinical mastitis, so it's based on what we want to reduce. We want to reduce the amount of mastitis uh, in the herd, so that's what we're breeding for. Then in 1987, we had uh, general health uh, included uh, in our index system. 2005, we put in longevity and calving direct, meaning how easy is the calf itself born, so it's giving a very good idea, can this bull be used on heifers or not? Then in 2011, we had, uh, sorry, uh, we had hoof health uh, coming in. So that index we have had now for more than 10 years with many, many data, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 of data uh, coming in to that index. 2016, young stock survival was, uh, was coming in as an index. 
And in 2020, we had a safe feed included that is our new index. And I'll come back to that because uh, we have a quite unique uh, index here that can really increase your efficiency in the herd. All of these indexes is put together in our total index, the Nordic Total Merit uh, NTM. It is uh, based under the Nordic condition, uh, but what's important here is that all trades in NTM have an economy importancy. So when we breed for them, that's because we're making money of improving the trades. And just to tell how complex it is, there's more than 90 sub trades in NTM and 15 main trades. And when we're looking for the red in the total merit index, 42% of the weight is going for production and efficiency, the safe feed. We have 42% going on health and reproduction and 15 on confirmation. So you can see we have a high focus on health and reproduction to get a good functional cow. If we then go into to the Viking Red, Viking Red is, matter of fact, it's not a breed, but it's a breeding program. And it's combined with the Finnish Aisha, the Swedish Red and the Danish Red. So it's those three breeds and three countries that is working together. Uh, and it's the same countries that is in Viking Genetic. Uh, the uh, Viking Genetic, uh, the, sorry, the Viking Red Breeding Program started back in 2008, where Denmark and Sweden went together, and in 10, Finland was joining. So this breeding program have been running for close to 12 years now. And uh, at the same time, we also have to remember that before, back in, uh, back before the the start of the breeding program, there was a large cooperation. So there have been exchange genetic between the countries for, for decades. It is a very strong uh, breeding program. We will say it is the strongest red breeding program in the world, 175,000 registered cows, genomically testing close to 3,000 bulls per year, and is uh, sending semen out, proctoring and testing 55 uh, bulls per year. Since we're having this uh, tree breeds put together, we also have a large variation, meaning that the inbreeding is low compared to other breeds. This giving us an advances in a larger genetic variation that in the long run should, could give some uh, increased genetic progress. And what is then the red cow? Uh, what is the strong side? It's definitely the health side the red cow have a high natural health. So when using the red, that is one of the places where we, you're gonna boost a lot. If we're looking at other health, where the red breed is quite excellent, we're talking about a low uh, amount of mastitis per lactation in average over the first uh, tree lactation, there is a 7.8% uh, mastitis uh, in average which is uh, quite low. So mastitis or other health, excellent for the red. If we're looking on the general health, they're also strong there. And it's again, average over the first tree lactation. Uh, we're having a low amount of early reproduction disorders, uh, a little bit more late, but it's still below the other breeds. And this is quite important that we're having a low amount here when we're talking about uh, a grazing concept, a spring block carving, where it's important we're having this carving interval. So that's a, a very good benefit in that system. We have very few uh, incidents of ketosis uh, in the red breed. Uh, and also other metabolic disorders is very low and 3.2%. And also a low amount of feet and legs problems. Uh, together with the good hoof health I'm coming to uh, later, showing that they have a good uh, ability to walk and thereby can handle the grazing also with some distance between the, the, the barn and, and the paddock. If we're going in to look at the hoof health, we are working with seven different traits in hoof health. It's the hoof trimmer giving in the data. So when they're trimming the cow, they are giving a score or look on each of the four hoof. And if they found some of the seven disorders 
in one of the hoof, they are registrating that in the system. And most importantly, we have to remember, they also registrate all the cows that have no treatment on the hoof. And that's very important that we get all the registration because without all the healthy cows, you cannot make a reliable index. To make it a little bit easier to say, okay, how can we show how much uh, hoof health is giving, how important it is? I will. Uh, I took an example. Uh, if we're having the bull Tiago, uh, a well-known, uh, proven sire, he have a hoof health index on 130. So that is three standard deviation uh, over average. What does this mean to his uh, to to the hoof health for his daughters? As a matter of fact, meaning that we will reduce the amount of hoof disorders from 22% from the one that will be the lowest, but up to 68%. So we're reducing the amount of hoof disorders between 22 and 68% by taking a bull with 130 in hoof health. So the indexes we have with a lot of the registration, a lot of good reliability, give us this uh, very, very good index where we can decrease uh, the incident of the hoof health uh, problems. If we are going uh, a little bit up uh, in the helicopter again uh, and look, how is it looking in the red breeds in, uh, in general? How is it looking across, uh, across the world? Um, I have here the interval rank. The red don't have a genomic base we can compare. So what we compare in the red breeds uh, among, around the world is the proven sires, the newly proven sires. Uh, and we need to remember that the proven sires, that is the foundation for the genomic sires we have. So the index level in the proven sires will give an uh, a indication of the future genomic image. If we look on production, we have here up in the top the, the, the Viking country, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, uh, and that have 100 and they have 103 in average in production. Now we're comparing to the other red population, we have uh, NIF, which is the other large red population uh, with uh, 96 in production, Canada and Canadian Asia, uh, 90, and then we have Australia and New Zealand uh, below uh, 90. So a good production level uh, in the red cow. I think uh, it's very uh, nice to see that even we have a high production level because we sometimes combine high production with a low otter health. But in otter health, the Viking red cows is also laying very nice compared to the other population, uh, close to the same in, in Norway and, and Canada, but it's good, uh, very good with the high production we have. And at the same time, it's not uh, it's shown in here, but also at the milking speed, the Viking red have a very good milking speed. So that's combining the good milking speed, high production, and at the same time, a good otter health. Then if we're looking on daughter fertility, uh, the Viking red is around average. Uh, and many of the other countries, Canada, New Zealand, and uh, uh, Australia is also around average. So also the other red population in grazing area, we have around the same fertility there, uh, which is quite good. Norway, uh, they have been breeding very much for fertility in many, many years. They have put a lot of effort in there. Uh, so they have an advantage uh, in fertility. We know that. But when you're breeding very much for one trait, it often costs you on other traits. And that's what also what we can see uh, when we see uh, Norwegian indexes in average here. There is some traits where they are quite much behind uh, because they have been breeding so intensely for fertility. Are we looking on direct calving? We are having around 101, so uh, in, in around the average. And then the maternal calving, meaning how good is the uh, cow to calf? Uh, there we have a, a good index, also around average, uh, but quite uh, much better, a standard deviation better than uh, that Norway. On longevity, the red is very unique here, it having extremely good longevity compared to the other uh, red population. That's also uh, combined with the high health uh, level in, in the Viking red. Are we looking on the 
uh, type traits. First frame, we need to remember there that frame is an index describing the cow. So a high frame index showing a bigger cow, while a low index showing a smaller cow in frame. So we can see that, that the Viking rat have a smaller uh, tendency to a smaller cow that, for example, NIF. But I only see this an advantage in the grazing system uh, where uh, Jersey is in, in the Golden Cross system. Uh, because we're having a smaller cow there, so it's coming uh, closer in the middle between Holstein and Jersey, and I'll get back to that. I we're looking on the other confirmation. Uh, Viking Red is 101, and Canada that we've been breeding for, for type traits for many, many years is 103, so we're laying very nice layer, uh, and uh, those two countries is, uh, is ahead of, uh, of the NIF uh, according to, uh, uh, to indexes in, in other confirmation. If you look up here in the end, I say it's very nice to see that the Viking Red is giving a, a, a high index level in all traits. So by using uh, the Viking Red, you will get a, a good improvement in average for all the traits that have an economy value. The newest traits coming in, that is breeding, uh, that's, sorry, that's uh, feed efficiency, and we are breeding for higher feed efficiency. Uh, and it's done with direct measurement of individual cows. Uh, which is very unique. We have uh, made in the Nordic country the index safe feed. It is built up by two uh, ingredients. It's uh, the maintenance, where we are saying that a large cow that have a lot of kilo on it, it need more feed to maintain itself. So the first part here is to get the, what are we saying, the engine running, while the second part here is the metabolic efficiency saying how good is the cow to convert feed into production. This one here, we have a lot of data, uh, weight measurement. Uh, you can use a confirmation trait. And here, uh, the AMS system, where there's a scale in them, also give information to maintenance so we can make a better safe feed index. This part, the metabolic efficiency, have been a big puzzle for many, many years, how to solve this, how to get information. Uh, and many is using the the blue boxes, as we call them, where you're nearly looking like a, a research station. We've gone in a little bit different direction in, uh, in Viking. Instead, we are going for cameras. You can see up here under the ceilings, they're hanging camera uh, all the way down, and they are taking pictures of the cows every fifth seconds. What is unique with this system is that we are measurement the cows in the normal uh, barn. There's nothing there, uh, not a blue box as you put the head in. They are acting ex exactly the same way that they would have done without the cameras. So we're not interacting in the cows daily business, their daily work. We are measuring the whole lactation and we are measuring across lactations. So we are getting information from both first to whatever 10th, 12th lactation, all the cows is measured. And at the same time, we can also measure uh, different breeds. So a unique system where we collect a lot of, a lot of data. For the red right now, we are having 2000 Viking red cows giving data in per year uh, into the system. Uh, so building up the reliability all the time. But it's also worth to mention when we're gonna talk crossbreeding later, that we also have 2,000 Jersey cows per year coming in with data, and we have 3,000 Holstein cows coming in with data. So we are collecting feed efficiency data on all breeds uh, in a very high uh, amount compared to, uh, to other systems. But how is this working? How can a camera uh, figure out how much feed a cow is eating? The whole foundation of the system is that when the cows have been milking, leaving the, the milking powder up here, we are taking a picture. They're sitting a camera up here, taking a picture of the cow. That's a normal picture, but it's also taking a deep picture. From this picture, we can we have an algorithm in it. It's, it's the same Facebook using to face recognize. And in that way, we can recognize each cow. So we can individually decide what cow we have there. Then when they're coming out and eating, we have the camera up here. Again, the camera take pictures of the cows. 
and they can identify each cows because they have already figured that out out here when they was coming from the milking powder. The camera is measuring the distance uh, from the camera down to the floor is in this case four and a half meter and to the top of the feet there's 4.2 meters. So it's measuring how much feed there's laying on the feed table. Then the cows start eating. And if you ever looked on a cow eating, they're not eating very politely. They are moving around, they are spinning the feed out. So, so it, it's quite much um, moving around with the, with the feed. So here the red spot, this is feed, liters of feed that have been removed, 14.39 liters. But other places that have been adding feed, pushing it up, spilling it when it's been eating. So there's been adding close to 11 liters. And if we submit those two, the cows have been eating 3.64 liters. Then we can convert liters into kilo of feed because we know exactly how much uh, a liter of feed is weighing. And on that way, we can calculate the feed efficiency directly on each cow every day through the whole lactation. But we are not only working with cows uh, in the Nordic country, we are also working with heifers and made a study there because feed efficiency in a cow and a heifer is not the same trait. They are correlated, but it's not the same trait. In Denmark, they want to figure out how the feed efficiency was in crush breeding between Holstein and Red, which meaning that to compare that, they also need to check the feed efficiency in the growing period for Holstein and Red. So they took in 62 heifers, around 20 Holstein, 20 crossbreeding, and 20 red. And they was feeding them with two ration. It was a standard one, that's the red in here, standard optimized for Holstein. So the, the feeding mixture was based for Holstein. And then they made a low energy ration that was um, uh, lower in energy, uh, but of course, uh, optimized on, on the other things. But it was a low energy, so it was also a cheaper feed mission to make. If we look in the Holstein here, the red one is their standard feeding. They're growing normally. But on the low energy, they was growing a lot less. And here the star is showing that there's a significant difference there. So Holstein was growing significant less on the feed with uh, less energy. Cross breeding, there was a little different. Uh, not so much, not significant. But if we're looking on the red intake, the red cow didn't care how much energy was, they was growing exactly the same on the two rations. And if you compare the Holstein and the red, we can also see that there's a crossbreeding heterosis, a crossbreeding effect here, because the crossbreeding is laying closer uh, to the red one compared to the, uh, the lions than the Holsteins. But how can it be uh, this uh, this different? How can they do it? And what's the benefit of it? Viking rats, they're having a higher capacity to grow and feed with less energy. And, and what they do is, matter of fact, that they are just, or just, they are increasing the feed intake. They're intaking more dry matter uh, to compensate. And when we have a cheaper feed ration, on that way we can save money. But it's also very, very efficiently when you have a grazing system. Because in a grazing system, it is not possible to every day for the whole season have exactly the same amount of energy in the grass and exactly the same amount of energy per cow. So over grazing season, we would have a little bit of difference in the, in the variation in the grass, meaning that when you have a cow that can, a heifer that can compensate for this, so in the period with not so much energy in the grass, they just compensate by eating more and thereby growing the same. Instead of uh, the challenge, for example, the Holstein, they maybe need to have supplement uh, if they should grow the same. So a very good uh, ability for the red uh, in the grazing system. And now I will let the word over to, to Matt. There's a, a poll here. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Um, so yeah, just wanted to draw your attention to the poll that we've put um, on the uh, on the screen there by using the button in the bottom right hand corner. Um, which of these five Viking red strips is a top priority for your herd? Um, so you can select uh, one of health, fertility, grazing efficiency, production and longevity. Um, so um, during the course of the rest of the webinar, I would ask if you were possible to to select one of those and submit the vote, that would be uh, that would be great. 
Um, I have the moment, I have no questions in either the questions box or the chat. Um, but if anybody does have any queries, please do feel free to to enter the uh, enter your questions into one of those uh, one of those uh, boxes. Um, and yeah, I would ask if you could possibly just put your vote uh, on the poll. That would be uh, that would be that would be great. Many thanks. Thank you, Matt. Then I would uh, moving a little bit further. Uh, you still have the possibility to think about the question in the poll, uh, but I'll slowly go over to the crossbreeding part because, as I said earlier, I look Viking Red as the secret ingredients uh, in the crossbreeding um, uh, system. I'll just get to work here. Uh, and when we're talking about the red, they are ideal for crossing. Uh, they are boosting the health, the fertility, and the efficiency in the crossbreeding program. And there's been many studies around the world with, with crossbreeding. And every time there's coming a new study from a country, it's showing the same, that the crossbreeding cows is doing fantastic. Uh, and it's widely used uh, crossbreeding uh, with a Viking Red uh, in the Golden Cross system in New Zealand, Australia, UK, Ireland, uh, and many other countries. But first of all, before I go so much into the, the Golden Cross system, uh, I will say that it's very important, I will say, to structure uh, crossbreeding. So if you're running a crossbreeding system, it should be structured because in that way, you benefit most of it, you get more tesserosis, you make most money out of it. So structure system, it's maximized the heterosis, so it will give you a larger profit. Um, you can um, avoid inbreeding risk uh, by doing this uh, because they will go three generations before you're back for the same breed. And in that way, you can either select uh, more of the best sires uh, in a top of each breeds. Uh, and by using a system where the breeds is working together, where they compensate each other very good, uh, you combine all the um, good trade from the different breeds and thereby optimize uh, the, the system and your profit. And first, uh, I will go a little bit into what do you win by going from two ways crosses to three way crosses and make that systematic. And this is also showing why it's important to make it systematic according to cirrhosis. If we're having a two ways crosses by time, it varying a little bit in the beginning, but over time, we would have 67% heterosis. Uh, so 67% of the uh, maximum heterosis, if you have uh, two unrelated animals um, or breeds um, for the two-way. But if you go to three-way crosses, you would have 86% of the heterosis, uh, which is quite high. So you get nearly the full heterosis with, uh, with three breeds. And one of the things when we are talking grazing and spring block carving, I would say one of the very good system is the Golden Cross based on the three breeds, uh, Viking Red, Viking Jersey and Viking Holstein. And I'll come a little bit back to why I said uh, Viking Jersey and Viking Holstein and why the complement is to the gut. Uh, if we say we're starting with the red uh, to put in, if you, for example, have a, a Holstein herd today, you can put in the red, the red will come in, boost the health, giving good calming tray, give longevity uh, into the into the Holsteins. Uh, and furthermore, also, if we're looking a little bit on size, the cows will be a bit smaller, but there will not be a huge variation between the Holstein and the first crosses with red. Then we are adding Viking jersey, and the and uh, the jersey will come in with solids, and there the Viking jersey have the highest uh, percentage of fat and protein in the milk uh, among the jerseys. They also have the best fertility and jersey will come in with a lot of fertility and they will come in with super hoof health uh, into the system. Then we are running back to the Holstein uh, and they also will uh, uh, say that the Viking Holstein is doing it uh, very well. It's giving uh, the production, it's giving more uh, volume of milk into it. 
it the Holstein, the Viking Holstein, they give the medium size, so we're not running away to getting too big uh, cows. When we have jersey in here, it's important that we are uh, taking account of that, and then they're giving in the good udders. So it's like these three breeds, they're compensating so good uh, in the system, they are nearly designed for the, for the, for the system. If we're looking a little bit around the size of the cows, it is important in the grazing system. We have here uh, the lactation, first, second, and third. This is based on the AMS data. We have the red cows uh, starting out with a little bit more than 500 kilo, uh, slightly smaller in weight compared to the Holstein. Uh, and then we have the Jersey as the lightest cow in the system. Uh, so a little bit lighter than the Holstein. So the red is, is between it, but closer to Holstein. But if we look on the stature, the red cow is 141 in average, the Holstein 149 and Jersey 130. And there the, the, the red is nearly in the middle. So showing that the red, you will get a little smaller cow in stature, but a little bit wider in frame, giving a little bit more capacity to the cow. All this thing you're probably thinking, oh yeah, uh, but is there anything in it? Can he prove it uh, or is it just air? Uh, there's a UK study where they compare three-week crosses compared to purebred Holstein. Uh, it's uh, AFBI that have done it where they have a, a herd uh, with Holstein. And then in that herd, there was also Jersey and Holstein crosses. And there was uh, mating with Viking Red. Uh, and it was in a spring calving production system. The key result uh, from that Holstein compared to, to the three-week crosses was that the fat and protein percent went up, got a higher amount of uh, concentrate in it, um, in the crosses. Uh, the dry matter intake was reduced and the body condition score was going up. But what was most amazing with the trial was that the health trait, the mastitis, and the, also the fertility, uh, was increasing a lot. So the mastitis was reduced by 77%, a tremendous uh, reduction uh, in, the, in, in the mastitis. And what does that mean in money? Yeah, if you have a 200 cows herd and you have this reduction in, uh, in mastitis, it is 10,000 uh, pounds you will make uh, out of it uh, in extra profit. Uh, that's uh, that's quite uh, a lot of uh, money into a, into a herd, and this is mainly done to that the three way cross, the golden cross, has 4.3 times less mastitis uh, cases compared to a purebred Holstein. And then on top of that, you can put the money in the bank, but you can also, I'm sure, be a lot more happy to take care of healthy animals uh, in the long run. But it's not only in UK they have made studies. We also have studies from Australia where they have compared three-way cross to two-way cross. And there was a significant increase in the conception rate after first service. There was an increased amount of pregnancies by week six. And there was an increasing in total fat and protein uh, production in kilo. This was all significant uh, difference. But if we look on the volume of milk, there was only 60 uh, liters indifferent and there was not significant uh, between them. So we get better fertility and better uh, kilo fat and protein and the same amount of milk. In New Zealand, this is also uh, a, a system they are using. They're using the, the Holstein and the Jersey cross they have that today, and then they're putting red in. And why do they do that? They do it for the ideal size. They do it to get fertility in, and they do it to get the health. Uh, and now I just need to make a small, uh, just give me one second, because there will come a video now, because I can talk a lot, but it's better that you hear it from a farmer in New Zealand. Just give me two seconds. I just want to be sure that there was sound on the video. It's not much fun to look on a video without sound.
Terms. Um, fertility is a big one for us. Um, we've, we've got acceptable levels of sort of um, 70 odd percent um, six week and calf rates and, and um, 10 to 12 percent empty rates, um, but we want to improve that. Um, and, and from what I have found through doing a, a bit of research and, and talking to farmers and, and, and repre representatives of different breeding companies, um, the red breed um, seems to tick those those boxes pretty well, particularly the health and uh, and the fertility of, of the of those cows. Um, obviously, we're on a, on a larger farm here, 230 hectares, so the cows can do a bit of walking at times, um, sort of half an hour walks to the shed. Um, so hoof health is quite important to us um, and. Uh, through the, the registration process of um, hoof trimming in Denmark, they've got some really uh, robust data sets to back up the claims that they put to their to their their bulls. Um. Yes, so that was how uh, the um, a New Zealand farmer uh, see the system with adding the three ways with the, the Viking red into it. But some of you maybe think, how do I go from a two-way to a three-way crossing if you already now have, for example, uh, Jersey Holstein crosses? Uh, it's very important that you make it systematic uh, so we benefit of it. So first you put in red on all your crossbreeding cows, and then you're taking, for example, Jersey, then Holstein, uh, and then you run into the system with back again. So when you have the cross, start in with the red, if you have the Jersey uh, Holstein, and then go on with the two other breeds, uh, but do it systematically. Then I'll show you a little bit of some of the bulls, or two bulls that will suit very good for the grazing. Uh, the first one uh, I'll go, I'll set, come, we're going to a trip uh, and show the, the bulls here. I think it's more fun to uh, see them, uh, just as light. Uh, here we have a Heckvin, a bull that will uh, boost the, the milk, but he's still giving a, a positive percentage uh, in the milk. He have a good production. But what's most important with him, he have an excellent uh, fertility. He got the, the easy calving. So you will get, uh, he can be used in heifers. The, the calves will easily come out. It's a giving a good longevity, average in frame size, uh, good udders with uh, good forward attachment, udder depth and front uh, tit placement. Uh, so Overall, a good all-round bull, and he also have a X week uh, available uh, if you're interesting uh, in that. The other bull I brought for the presentation uh, this evening is uh, Triad, uh, and uh, Triad, I would say he is what I will call a super super functional bull. Uh, it's not often we are finding bulls like him. He is uh, extremely good in uh, all what we call the soft uh, indexes. He's good in fertility, he's good in the calving traits, that's both direct, the calf itself, but it's also his daughters is easily calving, uh, super health, uh, and he had 134 in uh, hoof health. So he was better than Tiago we saw earlier with 130. So remember back to that slide, and if you use triad here, you will have that effect in, in your herd. He's good in survival traits, good longevity, good young stock survival, the workability, a good milking speed. So overall, a super bowl. And he will also, on top of that, give you increased percentage in the milk and a good growth for the heifers and the bull calves. Uh, so overall, a super, super functional bull that will boost the health in your herd. He's also available uh, in X week. Uh, uh, he just got in uh, with Siemens to, to UK uh, in the last week. So overall, uh, what we can offer uh, is we can building up a profitable and trouble-free herd. Uh, we can, or you can achieve higher profits uh, by reducing the cost and amount of work per cow. Uh, when you are adding in Viking Red into your crossbreeding system, it will boost the health, the fertility, and also the efficiency uh, in your grazing herd. Uh, and remember, you benefit from a structured breeding system with three-way crossing, 
uh, and that by maximize your heterosis effect. And the Viking rat, they will boost the efficiency of grazing uh, and they will keep their body condition and delivering a high lifetime product, pro profit uh, for your herd. So overall, very good boxes to tick off uh, in, in a dairy uh, production. That's all I had. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Jakob. Um, that's uh, that's a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so at the moment, Jakob, we have one question. Um, what is the average weight of a pure Viking red cow? And what would be the average weight of a Jersey Viking red cross be? Oh, we some are just going to share again then. Um... because I just gonna run back uh, through it because we had uh, we had the weight uh, up here earlier uh, so it's just easier to to show oh here we go show the weight here that's where we have the the weight for the for the red cow so a little bit more that that 500 kilos uh, start out in first lactation so a little bit lighter than the Holstein uh, in weight uh, but uh, some smaller in, in stature and when we uh, we are combining that, we normally say that uh, when you uh, mating these two, you would get the, the average of it. Uh, so in, in general, you would have a cow here when you're crossbreeding in, in first lactation on around 530 kilos. Uh, and then when you put in the, the, the jersey on top of that, uh, you would reduce it with around 75 kilos uh, for it. But if we're talking with, uh, for example, New Zealand, what they really like is the, the height of the cow. And they say that the side of the body is, uh, is what, what they're looking for. Uh, maybe a little bit smaller could be nice, but when they're putting jersey in, they're saying that they get the, the, the great side of it. Okay. Um, another question uh, that's come in is, um, we've talked about Golden Cross, um, but I'd be interested to hear a bit more about, Pro, about the Pro Cross system. Maybe um, there, Jakob, we could sort of say where the two systems fit, maybe. That could be in terms of... Yes. Yeah. Um, the Procross is, is also a very excellent uh, system. It's, it's a proven one that have scientifically proved for, from US showing very big benefits. Uh, but when we're talking about crossbreeding uh, in, in a herd, if we are starting up with crossbreeding, the most important part first is to sit down and say, what is my need? How is my uh, production system look like? Do I have a very uh, soil where a, 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 a heavy cow would not work when it's grazing? Uh, do I have a very small barn or do I have a large barn? Uh, are there a lot of grazing or are they inside the most of the year? Uh, and then fit uh, and then decide what crossbreeding system that will fit best to your production. And if you're having the cows housed uh, inside uh, a lot of the year. If you have an intense system uh, where you have a high input, uh, Procross will do fantastic. They they have shown excellent result uh, the, in, in US uh, and they will very much perform there uh, and easy going. Uh, but on the other side, I will say if you have a system with a lot of grazing, a system where you maybe say uh, you're reducing cost, that's one of your focused area, uh, you have smaller uh, barns, there, the, the Golden Cross will fit uh, very well in with the smaller cow, uh, better abilities to, to graze uh, with a good hoof health, uh, can walk a long distance. Um, there, the Golden Cross will fit uh, will fit very, very well. So it's depending on your, your condition, uh, what system that will suit you best. Okay, thanks for that, Jakob. Uh, there's no more questions. Uh, oh, hang on, no one's just come in. Uh, I've been looking at Fuzzy P. Do you think he would be a suitable bull for a spring grazing herd? <laughs> oh, he's one of my favorite bulls, so he, he's suitable for everything. <laughs> um, Fuzzy P is, uh, is a bull that's giving an extremely high amount of, uh, of fat and protein. He has extremely high percentage. Uh, as I remember, just two seconds, if I can find it. Uh, I have him right here. Um, and it's not something we have practiced and that it should be, it's just because I had him in a seminar yesterday. 
uh, he have 150 in protein percent, meaning his five standard deviation higher in, in protein percentage. So they will really increase uh, increase a lot. Uh, and he have this good uh, fertility, uh, very good otters, uh, good otter health, good young stock survival. So yes, he will fit in uh, in most of the herd, uh, also uh, with sexed semen. The only place I can say where maybe say is maybe not something for me. That is if you're paid on volume in milk, because you will reduce the kilo of milk, but boost the percentage. So when you're paid for fat and protein, he's an excellent, uh, excellent bull. And and also for the grazing system, yes. Yep, great. Um, so I think that answers all the questions, Jacob. Oh, um, just one, one, one comment I need to do a, a FOSCP because there's a video laying around and and I've heard the, the question sometimes, are you sure it's the right bull you have with Fuzzy? Are you sure he have horns? Because Fuzzy P is also Paul, so half of his offspring will be without horn. But he has what called skur. Uh, it's uh, 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 under laying under the pole. So the one that is single pole, the bulls there, they can have these skurs that look like horn, but not as horn. The good thing for you as a farmer is that it's nearly only the bulls getting the skurs. Uh, the cows get it uh, very seldom. So don't worry, you would not get a lot of cows running around with these small horns. It is mainly in the bulls. It is uh, affecting the, the sex. Okay, great. Okay, so I think that concludes all the questions uh, that we have in. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining the webinar this evening um, and wish you a nice evening. Many thanks. Bye-bye.